today we've got Joran Hoffman on the show from uh, founder of Redditus. Maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Thank you for, first of all, having me on the show. So I'm, I'm Joran, uh, based in the Netherlands in, in Utrecht. I've been uh, in the SaaS world, I think now for around eight years, something like that. Uh, I started off in a really small startup in Amsterdam, uh, really bootstrapped. So at one point, the, the, the funding got but it wasn't no funding. There was basically no money in the in the company anymore. Uh, after that, I went to a bit of a bigger startup. Uh, people might have heard of that. Uh, lead feeder joined there as a salesperson, which is my background. And then basically, when we sold a lot, I went into CS. So I joined when there were 18 people, and I left last February when there were around 130. So I had a good amount of growth in there. And as mentioned, I started in sales went to CS and left the company uh, last February as head of CS, where I led a team of uh, 25 people, which included support, customer engagement, and customer success managers. Oh, um, could you, do you mind just clarifying for our listeners what CS stands for actually? Yeah, because uh, I mean, CS is, is customer success and it's, it's all in the name, right? Making sure that your customers actually achieve success. So, I mean, when you look at SaaS, we, sell a product or we sell a service where people log into a web app and they want to get something out of it. So, uh, for example, with, with lead feeder, it was, uh, we, or they turn, uh, anonymous website visitors into leads. They don't want leads. They want sales. So, uh, for us, it was really important to make sure they actually acted on those leads to make sure it converted into the value they're looking for. And there was more, more revenue. So. Customer success is making sure that your client is going to be successful with the goal they have in mind to achieve. So uh, your tool is in that case, just, um, just I guess, like a product they use to make sure that you get the value they were looking for in the first place. Cool. So I, I have a practical question around being a customer success. Um, like we, we actually don't have a customer success team at Bird. Um, I guess it's sort of the responsibilities are a bit spread around everyone, but when you talked about, you know, looking into the data and you gave the example of Riverside, like, how, like what level of fidelity do you actually look into a, as a customer success person? And, and what I mean by this is I'm thinking of like our analytics and we have like, we look at the data overarching, like, oh, how many bug reports have been uploaded in, in total? And then we can kind of break it down to um, how many of these are product managers um, but then very rarely do we start looking at a specific account unless like, you know, we're going to have a conversation with them or they've, they've reached out to support and we need to dig in and understand. Whereas from what you describe, it sounds like that is the customer success responsibility. So then like, how do you do this practically? Do you have, do you have an X number of accounts that you're in charge of like analyzing all the time and keeping track of? Or are you also looking at it from quite a macro level, but just drilling deeper? Um, because I'm also thinking of this, like, you know, a big company, you're going to have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users. So like, how do you actually apply this deep customer success to such a huge user base? And, and like, how do you do this targeting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, to come back to the first point, like what you guys are doing now is really reactive, right? So the client has to take some kind of action to actually come in contact with you guys. And I guess that the, um, the question is, do you want to switch it around? Um, and I would look at, I guess, like the revenue the clients are paying. So when you go to that model, uh, your second example, when they have millions of users, you will probably have low tier users, meaning that they wouldn't pay you that much. They might pay you uh, between uh, zero and, and $20 per month. You would have 20 to 100 and 100 plus or I don't know the tiers, but I guess like what it would start with is you want to make sure that, of course, your bigger clients stay with you. Start um, using those as an experiment. So maybe just have one guy actually proactively reach out to them, figure out what their goals were when they started to use your tool, actually also figuring out if they are achieving those goals and what can you do to help them achieve those goals. And like... CS is pretty new. I mean, it's not that new anymore, but it's still a lot of experimenting. Like with in sales, it's easy, right? You hire a salesperson, he does X amount of calls. You can quickly see how many demos did he book and how much converted into sales. 
within CS, it will take a bit longer. So you kind of have to have a group and you could, if you want to get started, you can even say, okay, from the biggest clients, we're going to take 50% of our bucket and we're going to have somebody proactively reach out to 50% of them. The other 50%, we're going to do exactly as we did right now. And what is going to be the difference in, for example, churn? What is going to be the difference in, for example, upselling? What is going to be the difference in the clients actually getting value out of the product or using different features? So that could be a way, like we discussed that a lot of times within in, within like my previous company, but we're too big. Uh, so we basically would have said, we're going to drop some customers to get actually attention into not giving them attention anymore. But if you're trying out with CS, that could be a great way to start with. Segmentation can be based on anything, right? Super simple. It can be first on, on revenue. And at one point we went a step further. We did it on, on country level. So who, who speaks the language of the customers uh, because they already had sales in that in the native language. So we needed to make sure that the customer success was also in the native language. And then we looked at the monthly recurring revenue. And it doesn't mean that all clients have to have a customer success manager, but that's something you need to figure out within your company. Does it actually make sense for a human to reach out to certain uh, buckets of clients? Mm, okay, that's... Yeah, that's really, that's a really interesting way of going about it. So you've kind of got essentially structurally speaking, you would have sales, which are bringing in completely fresh new people in, and then you've got like custom support, which is the kind of reactive component of the company. And then now you have custom success, which is kind of in between, like it's the active component, which is reaching out and then to existing big company customers and you're measuring in terms of churn, upselling, client adoption, everything. Okay. So that all makes sense. And that's, that's awesome. Like, so where, where the question comes to mind now is again, another, another practical one for me is you look at like bird, for example, where we're at a scale where we know we've had, we don't even have a custom support team. That's basically still the founders like taking care of a lot of this stuff we do have a sales team now so we've we've created a sales team so chicken air question what comes first like when do you actually bring in a customer success team so what's like what's the kind of you know the the triggers or the the signals which kind of make you go okay i might need to start considering having a customer success person or a team I mean I would look at it from perspective, like why would, why are the, um, did you mention like it's now the founders, right? And probably you are involved in the sales process. So why do your uh, prospects get attention from the founders and your clients don't actually get attention? So when I look at my own startup, uh, like I'm using PyDrive as my CRM system, I have sales follow-ups uh, always, of course, available uh, or always present for every deal I'm working on. But I also have a pipeline which is premium clients and I always have an activity for those as well. So even though I'm um, still the, the founder as well like, and doing everything myself, I will have activities for my premium clients as well just to make sure that I check in them on a regular basis. Like, how are you doing? I actually noticed that you uh, haven't done X in the last month. Do you need any help? Or did you notice this guide from uh, we, we just published where it's easier for you to invite affiliates or something like that. So kind of giving them value along the way when they purchase your product, that could already be a, be a great start. And I guess like I would firstly look at your churn, like how high is your churn uh, and would it make sense to, to try to lower it or are there for the, uh, any upgrading examples you can do? So do you have now, for example, clients in a, in a lower tier? where you can actually, if you give them attention, they might actually get more value out of your product and you can upgrade them. So look at the metrics and define, I guess, like what the goal of a uh, customer success person could be. It could be a hybrid role at the beginning. If a salesperson is really good in talking to clients and he understands the product really well and the, and the end goal, you could also start uh, like that. Like that's kind of how I rolled into CS where I had a hybrid role because I was the only one speaking Dutch for my previous company, so I did the sales and then they also uh, came to me as a customer success manager, which they really liked because they had one person to deal with and I wasn't selling them anything I couldn't achieve because I was going to be responsible for their churn as well. So that could be a, a good beginning. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's nice. So so actually, it's so what you're saying, if I understand correctly, it's more like similar to I guess why the founders take care of custom support is because well, we don't really have enough volume of customer support requests to justify hiring someone to take care of it. And actually we can look at customer support, customer success, all of and sales, all of these in the same way, um, like essentially creating these automated pipelines to handle that initially until we feel like, oh, okay, actually this is too much for one person to do. We need a dedicated person and then bring in that person to take care of it. I mean, is it is it quite common for the first customer success person to essentially be a custom support person as well, like in that kind of like hybrid role? Good question. Like I think there it like when the company gets bigger, it are two different roles where um all the a lot of people who worked in customer support in my previous role, like they wouldn't be that comfortable in jumping on a lot of calls. So they were more comfortable in typing. They were really dedicated to be online during the, the time frames of support, really to make sure that they can help the clients as, as good as possible. But um, they weren't always the best people to actually talk to a human being uh, face-to-face or, or virtual via via meetings. We, When we look at, I guess, like the hires we did they often came from at least a customer facing role in types of for example sales where they already knew exactly how to sell or they already know how to have conversations with a client because when you have gonna have your first csm it doesn't mean that everybody wants to talk to them so in the end um, you still need of course sell the csm towards your clients because if you if they haven't had that touch with you yet you might actually have to really convince that they need to talk to your CSM to get value out of the tool because they didn't need one before. Why would they need one now? Now you 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 raise a really good point of like um, clients might not be used to or familiar with like a CSM manager. Um, uh, sorry, a customer success manager. Like what? So what are the tips or practical suggestions you have of like creating that relationship? Because you know we're just reaching out out of the blue. Yeah, like what do you do to, to sort of set up that process in? Yeah, I mean, like I would definitely start uh, from the beginning. So um, like how we, how we uh, set up CS in my previous company is that um, everything before the actual purchase was sales. After that, everything else was CS. So like what we did at one point, of course, sales introduced already CS. So basically it was, okay, if you're going to go premium, you're going to get your own dedicated customer success manager. Um, when you purchase, let's set up a call with them right away. So we kind of already sold customer success at the beginning to just to make sure that they would schedule that call. And it wasn't a combined um, target, but in the end, like a, we had people working really well together. So when you have native mm-hmm. people working together, they kind of introduced, of course, like your, your colleague along the route. And like, if you're going to have salespeople who are working on a commission base, um, you could also figure out like, okay, they're going to get more commission if clients stay for a year or if they stay for um, even longer than a year. So they are also, if they see the value of CS, they will introduce the CSM person. And like in app, um, you could do when they purchase, schedule a call with your customer success manager, like s- small things, right? But making sure that they book a call right away. Um, cause after, I guess they already use the product, they might not always want to have a call. So get that relationship as quickly as possible and then start, uh, expanding on it. Yeah. Just, uh, going back to what, uh, uh, Jackie was saying that like customer support being the first uh, step, uh, towards customer success. I have the impression that customer support is like, I think you mentioned is a very, it's more like of a passive uh, role, you know, or reactive. I wouldn't say, I don't know how to, to identify, but basically you are receiving the, the request from the client when actually in customer su- success and uh, sales, you actually reach out to the client. So it's a little bit more active uh, behavior. But um, also this reaching out to the client, the way that you're describing feels like a very, is a very kind of uh, labor intensive and manual process where you actively go and call and say, and kind of schedule appointments, etc. But at some point it becomes, I think that you could always keep some part of it uh, manual and kind of uh, 
human base, but at some point you also have to automate a lot of stuff uh, to make it happen, right? So how, how, how do we go about kind of creating this fine balance between the manual versus the automation and how much automation, when does that come in uh, according to size of companies, etc. So more about that. Yeah, um, I mean, automation is important, right? Same as sales, like you will run some sequences to get a meeting, um, like you can do the same within customer success. Um, like for example, if you have really low tier clients, so low tier, just looking at monthly recurring revenue, for example, it would probably wouldn't make sense to have a customer success manager on it because they would need, I don't know, 200 accounts where they need to uh, guide them through to get value. So from there, you could already think about automation. So instead of doing a 30 minute demo one-on-one, why not do a webinar where you can actually uh, guide them towards uh, the same value, but then in a more, um, scalable approach. So you could think about mm -hmm. like pre-recording the webinar or doing a, a live one every every week. Um, and I guess like um, that to come back, like I would definitely look at the client base and what would make sense to start working with clients. And I would always start with the bigger ones, of course, to figure out, does it actually make sense to, to guide them through it and then see what the need is going to be? Because within customer success, like a really big term is QBRs, quarterly business reviews. Do people actually want them? Like it's it's a, it's a an ugly word. Uh, if you put that in somebody's calendar, he's probably going to decline it like most of the times. So think about what the client actually wants. So make sure you help them to achieve their goal, help them to achieve their value. So he doesn't want to talk to you on a quarterly basis if he doesn't know he's going to get value out of it. So again, why did they, in the first place, did they started using your tool and how are you actually helping them to achieve that? So it's it's not your meeting, it should be their meeting where uh, you're gonna help them to achieve value. Got it. It sounds almost like a, a, a something you could actually sell as a extra. For, so for example, it's, it feels that the, 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 the bigger clients and more important clients are the ones who actually get you as uh, a customer success, someone that is basically dealing with them uh, all the time. And that is it something that that could be understood as, okay, this plan, you also get a CS representative just for you. Do you also do that in that direction? Yeah. Yeah, we've done that before. We even offered like uh, customer success as a service. If they, for example, weren't in the tier, they were able to get a customer success manager. They could upgrade their plan and actually get a dedicated customer success manager. So you can even use it as an upgrade. So as a, it's, I mean, it's not software upgrade, but it is a manual upgrade where you can get more monthly recurring revenue from them if you actually help them to to get to their goal. So, but it, like. A lot, a lot of SaaS companies would indeed have like a dedicated customer success manager if you would only purchase a certain plan. To come back to your original point, as in, like you mentioned, you guys are doing now a lot of uh, support. Like um, I, I do, for example, support myself as well. I'm hoping now nobody, nobody's opening up the support chat. Um, but what I do, like I try to turn it into a quick call, for example, sometimes where if they can't figure something out, let's just jump on a call. Because I do get a lot more value and a lot more feedback from actually uh, jumping on a call. They see my face, they know who I am, and they would open up more to actually let me know how how ready this is working for them. So I guess like um, what I'm trying to say to you guys, as like you mentioned, like you're doing just support and it's really reactive, right? Like try to actually, when you start engaging with your paid clients, you will get so much more feedback. So at the beginning, like as a founder doing calls with your premium clients, it's just gonna give you so much uh, so much feedback. Because the, to give one example, like I received a mock-up from a client of ours, a paid client of ours, where he basically did a mock-up of a page, uh, of our landing page, of, of his landing page, which we created for him. And he wanted to jump on a call, but because I already built that relationship, he kind of just helped me build the product. Uh, so we jumped on another call. He showed me what he actually wanted to achieve. And now uh, two and a half weeks later, it's implemented for all our clients. So this is what a relationship, I guess, with clients can do when you really talk to them and, and listen to them. So we, we also um, 
So I would say like, yeah, we're definitely not as active as the way you describe it of having someone who's, you know, reaching out to all the premium clients directly and trying to build that relationship. I mean, we have that on the sales side, but certainly not on a, on an ongoing basis. And I mean, having a conversation with you now definitely has triggered that thought in my mind of like, oh damn, like <laughs> we haven't been doing this, but um, the other things that we do have, and I guess this is a bit more of, um, you know, when you get, when you start out and you're resource strapped, so you try and find the solutions, which, uh, you know, get you 80% of the way. So we, we set up like a, a community, uh, like a, a Slack community, for example, some other startups have, have discord and we get some of the interactions that you describe as well, where, you know, we've got some users who are clearly like power users really engage and would also send mock-ups and things like that. So, um, that, that gave me a good bit of a question on my side, actually, because the community stuff is again, one of those things where you create it, but you need to nurture it. You need to like, encourage interaction and feed into it and you need to make it feel like a space otherwise it, it quickly becomes you know you see the the kind of like hay bales rolling along it feels a bit dead um but we also have this challenge of like who exactly is responsible for the community and then someone i remember brought up like oh yeah we need to hire a community manager and they would take care of like all of social media and all that stuff but yeah, I'm just curious whether customer success like overlaps into these spaces as well, because so far you've described it very much as focusing on the premium accounts, but then you also have all these lower tier accounts, which I'm assuming still accounts for something in the business, right? Because you want to make these people happy because they also help you spread the word of the business. So does customer success get involved in that or is that, if not, like who do you think is responsible for the lower tier side of things yeah i mean in my opinion customer success is responsible for all paid clients so basically for the monthly recurring revenue and then the churn related to that so yes they would definitely be engaged in the in the community i guess like the, with the community it's, it it is always tricky as in um it could be a nice way i guess to start for a, a customer success person to come on board but uh, for for him or her as well, it's going to be, I guess, a, a side job or they need to be responsible for the entire uh, paid client bucket, I guess. But um, indeed, like you need to have somebody who's going to um, take things forward. Because like, for example, personally, I'm in 10 Slack groups. Like I wouldn't engage that much, of course, in, in all of them. And I think I'm not the only one. Maybe 10 is a bit too much, but I, I would say maybe three to five is, is the average. So, um, and there again, it's really reactive. Like uh, in you guys probably respond to people's questions and, and things like that. But are you also, for example, taking the other way around as in we have been thinking to doing X, Y, Z, what do you guys think? And then would you actually jump on a call with them to hear their opinion or just do you want to see that one phrase sentence in Slack? So you again, you get a lot more information by talking to human um, besides than just just chat like you can see now right if you ask me something about cs on chat i would probably give you one sentence and now i'm giving you one hour of of content which is going to help you to to think about cs in a different way so um i guess to come back to the point like i would definitely put something like i wouldn't hire i guess a community manager i would then hire somebody who's going to be responsible for the paid clients so definitely put it in in cs and then the community definitely can be part of it because they have to talk to the power users and then the power user can be low tier or or high tier i guess that that doesn't matter but at yeah. least hearing out what they're what they're looking for you you mentioned um that with a lot of these clients you would want to you know they they reach out to you or there's a problem and it's just easier to get them into a call so you can have a conversation and build that relationship like yeah i i, I totally understand the benefit of this like we we do a lot of user interviews for example and every time you just talk to a user, like nothing beats having some face-to-face -face time, right? And like 
having a bit of humor in the conversation. And it's so different to just that kind of chat where you have no idea what the other person looks like. Um, my question though, on this front is at the same time, it's generally, especially with like business clients, it's quite hard to get time from them onto a call. And like one of the things that comes, came to my mind is like, you know, they're probably thinking, oh, I'm paying, we're paying for this product. We're, we're enjoying it. We've had a couple of calls. Like in your experience, how interested or how engaged are our customers to, to want to continue having these calls and conversations? Because, you know, everyone's kind of like always really busy, always has a lot of calls, especially now with remote working, we've got even more calls. Yeah. How, like how open are they and how much do they like it versus, you know, it being more of a benefit to you as a customer success and the company versus the, the users themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's up to you, right? Like, uh, how, how do you going to approach those calls? Like, is it just you asking a couple of questions? How are you doing? How do you like the product? Or are you actually going to provide them value as in, uh, we look into your account. We actually said the X, Y, Z, we should recommend doing this. Or again, like we saw this client doing this, I would definitely recommend looking into that or. I mean, if you provide value during those calls, then they more likely, of course, to attend the next one as well. Like if you're really trying to help them, then they might even ask for a new call next month again. So it's really, I guess, like how you approach them. Um, Cause in the end, like if you again, help them to achieve their goal, the churn would go down. You probably get more feedback to make sure that uh, your product becomes better. And in the end, you're going to turn them into G2 reviews or trust radius reviews. And then uh, it's going to help the entire company. So don't do calls for the sake of calls. Make sure you actually provide value during them. So um, see what they what they have been doing. It's the same as a sales call. You need to prep them. You need to figure out uh, where are they right now and how can they go to the to the next step. And it's also, I think it makes it easier because it's uh, it, you're not you're probably not trying to sell them stuff, but basically you're trying to help them more so i think that kind of uh, exactly it's, it's a better call than a sales call let's say it's an easier call to have if you find a person who really generally wants to help them then you have a good customer success manager so yes you need to have some kind of mindset where they are not afraid to talk to clients but they need to just really want to help people and then uh, you can definitely see the numbers in either usage churn uh, the number of feedback etc got it um, what is the difference between uh, CS for in B2B, which is mostly, I think, what we've been talking about, and CS in B2C companies? Yeah. I mean, I haven't been working uh, in B2C SaaS myself, but I guess like when you look at B2B in general, the ticket prices are a bit higher, right? So um, like where B2C is maybe 10 to to $50 per so it starts at, at 40, 50, and then can go up to 1,000 plus. So I guess the uh, amount of labor you can do per client increases as well. So like with B2C, you probably need a lot more automation. People probably don't even want to talk to a human being versus uh, B2B where the, pri like the prices of the product are higher and you want to probably talk to them to make sure that they don't churn. So I think th those will be the the biggest difference but we like within b2b we can definitely learn a lot from from b2c because when you open up any app like for example um what is it like hello fresh for example if you want to cancel or something is wrong with the product and you put it in the app they always try to save you or give you a small discount to make you happy right away uh, things like that so those kind of things happen in b2b as well right where you can either cancel your product you hit that red button and it cancels automatically or they try to save you again, as in why you're actually trying to uh, cancel your product. You have five options and those options will revert into a solution again, really trying to, to save you. So short answer, B2C is gonna be more automated because the volume is gonna be higher, ticket prices are gonna be lower and B2B is gonna be more uh, manual when the price are gonna be, be higher. Because in the end, you don't wanna lose a thousand dollar client uh, without ever having uh, talk to him in the last six months like that's for me that's no option has the, has the custom like success it. role always been around or has it kind of been become more prevalent and become more popular 
in in the like recent years maybe particularly because you know b2b SaaS has been booming itself too because i like in, in my personal experience it seems like i hear so much more about the customer success role nowadays compared to you know five six years ago yeah no it's, it's definitely more popular but i guess also because of the um, the potential extra revenue or the potential extra growth cs can bring right like if you decrease your churn with one percent uh, it, it's going to have a huge impact on the growth of your company so uh, if you can even get like a, a negative churn like you can increase the growth of your company exponentially so I think it's just because people actually notice that when you talk to your clients and you figure out what they really want and make sure that they stay, um, you don't always have, like you're not filling up a leak in bucket, as you say. So um, if you can keep the bucket at the bottom hole, then you can just fill it up with new clients. And like that is the biggest value, of course, yes, can bring where if you keep your current clients, you're not losing them. You just have to add on top of that. And then your growth is going to be a lot faster. Okay, then. So then the million dollar question, since, um, you know, a CS who can retain 1% could be a huge amount. How do you find a great customer success person? Like what, cause you know, we talked about customer success so far and we're like, okay, it's, uh, different from customer support. It's different from sales, but then actually when they talk about onboarding, it has some relevance to product as well. Uh, I haven't touched on that question yet, but like how it overlaps with product management, but Back to this, yeah, like what what skills, like, yeah, what do you look for when you're interviewing customer success, potential customer success hires? What's the hallmarks of a good one? You already mentioned like, you know, people who just genuinely want to help, but you know, how do you look for these, these kind of traits in an interview? Yeah, I mean, uh, just, I guess, how I, I rolled into, into CS or into lead feeder back in the day, and I think what made me a good CS person is that I actually used their tool before I started working there. So I knew exactly the ins and outs. I knew exactly the challenges somebody would have with using the product. I moved to, to sell the product and then I can also um, quickly move to CS because I kind of knew exactly what the clients were trying to achieve. So to answer the question, like what does somebody need? They need to understand the value the product brings. Like they need to understand, of course, what the product actually does and how they need to use it uh, in order to make sure that they get they get value out of that and then they don't have to be afraid to talk to clients because again tsms um if you're going to implement them when you haven't had them before it doesn't mean that everybody wants to talk to them so they need to make sure that they're comfortable with following up with clients providing them value making sure that they record a quick video to show hey have you seen this or do you want to jump on a quick call because i noticed um this in your account or so basically you need to have somebody who's not shy uh who knows the product and then knows how to make sure that they can they can educate your clients in a in a way uh they like so you know you know when you bring up the point about like knows the product it that's like so true when it comes to hiring product managers designers engineers and it it still baffles me how often you do interviews nowadays and then you're like so have you tried our products and they're like no it's just like you're gonna if you're gonna apply to the job and look to join a company for at least a few years at least know what you're going to be building i can't it, like, it doesn't it astounds me when that happens yeah like one one question we would always ask is basically what does a product do and it's a super simple question but you get the most random random answer so um that is something, or what is the value uh, our product is giving to our clients? Or what do you think the value is the product is giving to the clients? Like if you if you do that, you kind of already know, have they looked at your product and do they actually know why clients are using it? Okay, nice, I just, I just noted those down, they're so good.